one's actually one of my one of my favorite battles. Uh, this is the Battle of Cowpens, and what's interesting is it actually gets its name because the battlefield itself used to be called Hannah's Cowpens, and it was an area where uh, local people actually brought their cattle to graze. So it's just kind of a field here. What you have in the back is a river, and you have a hill here and a slightly smaller hill here, flat area here, and woods uh, down here. What you have is the American Army, part of the American Army in South Carolina, under uh, Brigadier General Daniel Morgan. He has under 2,000 soldiers, and it's kind of a mixed bag of who he has. And he has been sent out uh, into uh, this area really to kind of bolster the, uh, the, the colonials in the area. His job is to go around, look for, basically forage for food, and to show the people of South Carolina that there, there still is an army, that they, they're still out there to protect them. Because there's been a real string of uh, British victories, and the southern campaign isn't really going that well for the Americans. And what happens is uh, Lord Cornwallis recognizes that there is an enemy force out there that could potentially threaten his flank. And so what he does is he is going to send one of his cavalry commanders, a gentleman named Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, uh, out with his forces to try to catch uh, Daniel Morgan's men. And if he can catch them and he can dispatch them, then what's going to happen is Cornwallis is going to have really an open playing field in the American South. And what uh, Morgan has to do is, number one, try to survive, and number two, try to find a way to defeat the British. And one of the things you should know about Tarleton is he has an interesting reputation. He is young. He's 26 years old. He's brash. Uh, he also was in charge when British regulars massacred Americans who had already surrendered. And so uh, the Americans gave him the name uh, Butcher. They gave him a lot of names, but they did not like him. And uh, But he was a very... He was a good cavalry or dragoon officer. The Americans are going to have uh, a, a bunch of irregulars. A lot of them, about 150 of them, are going to be uh, riflemen. We've already discussed the difference between a smoothbore musket and a rifle. These guys are crack shots. Then there's going to be 300 militia. Now, you know the militia is just regular people, basically trained, uh, who are sometimes good to shoot at the enemy. But usually what happens is they shoot and scoot. They'll fire their guns, say, I'm good, and run away. That's a problem. The uh, Continental Infantry, there's a lot of them. And uh, they are good. Many of them are from Maryland. And they are well trained. They are the equal to the British regulars, for the most part. And then there's a small number of cavalry under uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Washington. And Washington, just so you know, was a second cousin to George Washington. What uh, Tarleton's going to do is he is going to be far away from the Americans. And he decides, once he figures out where they are, he's going to chase them down. The problem with this is, in the last 48 hours, I mean, really over the last four to five days, but really over the last 48 hours, he's been pushing his men hard. He's not giving them enough food. He's not giving them enough sleep. Literally, in the last two days, they haven't had anything to eat. But he believes that if he can capture Morgan, particularly before Morgan can cross this river, then he's going to win. And so he pushes his troops extremely hard. Now, Morgan knows that Tarleton is coming. He knows the area. So what he does is he situates his forces using the battlefield to his advantage. He also knows that because there's a big river there, his men can't retreat, even if they're scared. So he specifically put his troops with their backs to the river. That's actually a smart move. He also puts his skirmishers or riflemen in the front. 
Then he puts his militia here. His regular continentals are on this ridge. Now you can see them, but they're in the back, which is strange. Normally you would put your strongest troops toward the front. Morgan himself is here. Hidden behind the second ridge is the cavalry under Washington. So what's going to happen is Tarleton is going to chase the Americans. His troops are super tired. In fact, his dragoons break into the field first, and they see the Americans, and they actually launch an attack, which is repulsed. Actually, 15 dragoons are shot down, primarily by the riflemen. That's when Tarleton realizes, oh my goodness, I've got them. There's a river there. I can't lose. And so what he's going to do is he's going to form up at about 7 in the morning, and he's going to order a general advance. He knows that his, what he thinks are superior numbers and better trained troops are going to win. He looks at the battlefield and he's like, you've got to be kidding me. They've got irregulars here, not a uniform that's common amongst them. Then behind them, farmers, the militia. Oh, this is going to be beautiful. Morgan expected this. This was part of what he wanted to do. And what he told these guys to do, he said, I want you guys, once the enemy comes within range, to fire twice. That ends up being, after the first shot, 20 seconds to reload, second shot, then get the heck out of there. That's what he told them to do. He said, just shoot twice, and then run away. All right. It's a pretty big deal. He told his first line of skirmishers, when the British come in range, shoot the officers. All of them. And these guys are like, all right, we can do that. All right. His Continentals stay up here, cavalry here. What happens is a general advance. Now, Tarleton does have two cannon, and they're small ones. They're three-pounders. They're called like, grasshopper cannons, and he brings them up with his troops to support the advance. He brings them up pretty far. What you have here is a cavalry unit, cavalry unit, reserve with Tarleton himself, Infantry, gun, infantry, gun, loyalist infantry. These are American colonists who are loyal to Britain. And then this happens to be the 71st uh, Highlanders, right? And they advance. So what they're doing is they are moving forward. As they move forward, these riflemen start to pick off the officers. And this is extremely demoralizing when you see your officer go down. But you keep marching. These guys eventually hit this front line. And the riflemen did something interesting. They didn't break and run. They backed up. And where they backed up was here. They still haven't really suffered any casualties. Because they're not in range yet. The British move forward, and they come into contact with the militia. Now, the militia always break and run. The militia fire once, and then they reload. Then they fire twice, and they run. They leave. All of these guys leave. The militia runs away this way. The riflemen back up here. But they really still haven't taken any casualties. They mingle with the regular colonials. This was all planned. What happens is then you have this advance and what they have to do is the British have to go up this hill and every time they come up to one line, whether it's the skirmishers or whether it's the militia, they're taking casualties, and this is a basic a, a, an assault, and they're hitting a defense in depth. So they hit the first line, they make it through. They hit the second line, 
they make it through, but they're taking casualties and it slows everything down. Then what's going to happen, and you can see this occurring, this cavalry sweeps forward. Why are they sweeping forward? Who are they going after? Yeah, they think they're going to get the militia. They're like, we got these guys. They're running. All of the British forces get up to this ridge. And what are they met with? They're met with the colonials who are well trained and they start to fire down withering musketry onto the British who are injured, they're tired, they're hungry, and they're charging uphill. And this fire must have been devastating. These guys are well rested. They've got accurate rifle fire. Tarleton sends in the 71st Highlanders onto the wing here, which was a smart move, hoping that he can flank. Unfortunately, these guys receive the wrong order. They think they're supposed to retreat, so they move backward, kind of like that. The order was not to retreat, it was actually to attack. And what's going to happen is the Highlanders, extremely, extremely experienced, brave soldiers, charge this way. And then what happens these guys were given the order to stop, turn, and fire. When the Highlanders were about 30, maybe 30 feet away, they were met with unbelievable musket fire, point blank. It decimated them. They were not expecting it. This cavalry under Washington sweeps in here and stops this cavalry advance. These guys swept all the way around and appear on this side. Eventually, what happens, there's a melee, and this side gets covered by American cavalry. At this point, Tarleton's like, oh my, because his troops have been enveloped. And there's a chance they could be completely encircled. Here's what Morgan does at this point. He launches a bayonet charge into the British forces. And it utterly demoralizes them. According to uh, battlefield sources, at this point, half of the British either completely stopped fighting raised up their weapons. Rather than laying down your weapons, often you held your weapon upside down to signal that you were surrendering. Or some of them hit the ground pretending to be injured. 50% of this force, when they saw the American colonials charging, gave up. Some continued to fight. The Highlanders attempted to continue to fight, but it was a losing proposition. The British are not going to win. Tarleton orders his cavalry that he had in reserve to charge forward. They ran. They said, no. No, they're not, they're not going to continue the fight. What's interesting is Tarleton himself, he's a brave man, is going to get involved here. And he's actually going to be challenged by Washington. And Washington says to Tarleton, where is, the, where is the boasting Tarleton now? And Tarleton pulls out his pistol and shoots Washington's horse. And then runs away. <laughs> All right. The Americans, the Americans take the field, number one. Number two, what ends up happening is they lose about 25 men. 25 men were killed in this battle. All right. They started out with about 2,000-ish. The British had fewer men, a little over 1,100. But what the British are going to do is they're going to lose 110 of their soldiers. They're going to lose over 800 men, either missing or prisoners of war. They're also going to lose their two cannon. And what this did 
is it gave the Americans faith that they could continue to fight. It also crushed some of the greatest soldiers that Cornwallis had. These were not crummy soldiers. These were well-trained, well-equipped soldiers, and they just got outwitted because Daniel Morgan understood his own forces. He knew that the militia would break, and so he planned on it. He told them to break. He said, all I need is two shots, and then you can back off. All right, but do it in an organized fashion. He knew that Tarleton was impetuous and would not get a good look at the battlefield and would just charge. And that's exactly what he did. So Morgan knew the battlefield, he knew his own strengths, and he knew the characteristics of his enemy. And he used it to his advantage. What's going to happen is Cornwallis is going to realize, I've lost a lot of my reconnaissance, I've lost a lot of my uh, power, and so I'm going to head north. He's going to head north into North Carolina. What's going to happen eventually, slowly, is American victory after American victory, of course, with the help of the French. Uh, and eventually, uh, Cornwallis is going to find himself uh, under siege at Yorktown, and you're going to see the eventual freedom of America. Right? Kind of a cool battle. For the number of people involved, it was extremely, extremely important. Tarleton himself survived the war, and he ends up uh, in Parliament, uh, and he later, in a subsequent battle, loses two of his fingers. Just thought that was interesting to note. Uh, and uh, Daniel Morgan, who actually was uh, related to uh, Daniel Boone, which I think is very interesting, uh, also survived the war. Uh, pretty darn big deal. All right. Thanks, guys. That was fun. Questions?